Hey, good morning, and uh, welcome here to Essential Baptist Church. Good morning, all the folks out in Refuge, live streaming, live Facebook, television. So glad that all of you are with us today. If you've got a Bible with you, I invite you to take it. Let's turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. We've got 11 verses today that we're going to look at. Some of you are brand new here today for the first time. So glad you're here. Again, if I hadn't met you before, my name is Archie Mason. I'm a senior pastor. We are teaching through the Bible uh, in a year. We started last August, and so we've made it into the New Testament, and we're going through this August. And right now, uh, we're in kind of a small smaller series in the big panorama series, which we call the movement, as we look at the church in Acts. The church in Acts, we see this, the early beginnings of, man, it was on the move. God was doing some great and mighty things. So today, we're in a passage of Scripture that deals with Ananias and Sapphira. And what you're going to see is you're going to see how Satan, you know, in the past has been attacking from the outside. Well, now he tries to attack the church from the inside, and the title of today's message is A Secret Sin. Now, if you've been here with me for a period of time, you may look at that outline and say, man, it looks familiar. I taught this same outline when I was in the book of Joshua and teaching uh, about Achan and his sin. And so this New Testament passage pretty well par- parallels the uh, Old Testament passage. And so, again, it's the same outline. Now, as a kid, I grew up in Duvall's Buff High School or Duvall's Buff School. We no longer, I went to school with the same kids from first through 12th grade, no longer school, part of the school consolidation stuff. My mom's still mad at Governor Huckabee, by the way. I'll just point that out. So if you're watching mom, I feel your pain. Anyway, okay, so we don't have a school. They're all spread out everywhere now. But when I was on the playground, probably in the second or third grade, there'd always be a girl, you know, a little girl, and she'd look at me or something, and she'd do a finger like this, you know. Now, as a boy, when a little girl, you're in third grade, when they do that, you're kind of like, okay, you know, I don't know. And you go over, and you may, you may look at her and go, uh, what, what's up? And she'll go, you want to know a secret, now, guys are different from girls, you know that. So there's something about when a little girl says, you want to know a secret? It's like, okay. And she says, now, you got to come close, and you're the only one who knows this. Nobody else knows. And so as a little boy, you bend down, and you say, okay, tell me. And she goes, Billy likes Susan. And you're like, no way. No, she said, don't tell anybody. And so all day, you're sitting in class, you're looking at Billy going, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, you like her. I know you do. And you think, I'm the only one who knows. You get on the school bus, guess what? Everybody knows that Billy likes Susan on the school bus, okay? Because secrets have a way of uh, coming out, coming to the light. And what we're going to see today in the life of believers that your sin, as the book of Numbers says, chapter 32, it will find you out uh, in regard to that. So, again, hopefully you found that place there in the past scripture, Acts 5. Would you stand with me for the public reading? Of Scripture, Some, again, are here for the first time. I always teach from a New American Standard version uh, of the Bible, very literal to Greek and Hebrew. Follow along as I read. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and carried him out, and they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval, about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the lamb for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. And then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and all who heard of these things. Let's pray. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. And because there is no other name and no other name given to us under heaven whereby we may be saved. So we come to you, Father, and we can only come to you in the name of Jesus and through his blood. That's how we have access to the Holy of Holies. And so, Lord, thank you for loving us. And we can only love you because you first loved us. Romans 5 8. So, Lord, have your way with us today. Give us understanding of this passage of Scripture. Lord, help us to understand secret sin. And hidden sin, we think that nobody knows, and it's never hidden, never secret. And, man, Lord, just to grasp that. So maybe today as we move through this passage, Holy Spirit, there can be some conviction and repentance and things we need to get right, uh, Lord, today. In the lives of believers, oh, Lord, there may be someone here who's an unbeliever that Holy Spirit, 
that you're pointing out sin even now. They need to come in confession and faith and repentance and be gloriously saved today just as I was at the age of 25. And so, Father, I pray, have your way among us today. In your name we pray, the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. And out in refuge, I always appreciate those guys at campus standing uh, for the public reading of Scripture. Secret sin is uh, never secret, okay? You'll see that there on the outline. Secret sin, hidden sin is always against God. And then lastly, as you can tell by the context of the passage, secret sin has a uh, some pretty dramatic consequences to it in and of itself. You know, when you, you look at this passage, you got to think, well, how in the world? Because I know, you know, I grew up in Prairie County, Bisco, Arkansas, and I know some of you say, man, you just, this country is dirt, and I get it, but what you need to realize is God killed two people right here in this passage. And I know today in our culture, you say, it's not very palatable. He's a God of love. He is a God of love. He's a God of wrath. He killed two people in this passage of Scripture. And so when you begin to, to look at you, you may think, what in the world has happened in these uh, 11 verses? How did it get to this place? And I'm glad you asked that question, so let me share it with you, okay? So when you go back in Acts chapter 4, if you were here last week, if you missed it, go back and watch the passage and the preaching of that. But Acts chapter 4, you know, you got Peter and John go before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin threatens them. Peter says, hey, you know what? Well, it's right in the sight of God to honor you or to honor God. We're going to honor God, you know. And so they go out. And then the Bible tells us that those men are, are preaching with great confidence or filled with the Spirit. And it says where they were praying, they said that, the, man, the Holy Spirit moves and shakes the place. And so you see that there in Acts chapter 4. And then if you got a Bible with you and you look up about verse 32 or look up in the app in the Bible translation, it says, and the congregation of those who believe were one heart and soul, not one of them claiming anything belonging to itself. Now, what you see right there in Acts chapter 4 is you see great unity uh, in the fellowship. You see same purpose, same mission, same, I mean, there's the power of God is moving. And he says the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was not a need person among them. So it'd be like today uh, in the culture, if you said, hey, Archie, you got a lawnmower I could borrow. I go, man, come get that lawnmower. I'll put the gas in it. I'll get the oil going. You crank, you keep it as long as you need it. You know, you come get us. Hey, by the way, you know, Angie's going to be making me some cookies this afternoon. You got a blender. Oh, yeah. You come get Mary Jo's blender. You can have it as long. I mean, they were sharing, you know, with one another. They were brothers and sisters in Christ. If somebody's house burnt, then we see this in our church. Man, your, your house burned down. What's the church do? Comes together, man starts, you know, giving money or clothes or bed or something to help you out or find a place to live. I mean, that's the, the church. But what we see here in the early church, man, it was just magnified. It was the, the movement of God was at work. And then the introduction to Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Some of you have that gift of exhortation. You encourage people. I mean, man, you around folks, you just build them up. And Barnabas seems to have been this type of a guy, believer in the Lord Jesus. The Bible tells us there at the end of Acts 4, he has a piece of property. And so he sells it, and he's not looking for accolades or fanfare or want somebody to go, way to go, Barnabas. You know, he wasn't looking for that. He takes that money, and he lays it at the feet of the apostles to be done with as they chose. See, he was a man of humility. Uh, he was a man, like I said, who didn't want the praise. Uh, but he said God had put it upon his heart to buy the property and to sell it and to give the money to the apostles to be distributed. You see, Satan had been attacking from the outside through persecution, I believe, and, you know, Peter and John going to jail and all this kind of stuff. Well, he changes his strategy, and now he begins to attack through the inside. And chapter 5 picks up, says, but a man named Ananias. Now, in the context of this, we see where Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, they get together and say, hey, we got this piece of property, and so let's, let's sell it, but let's hold back a portion of the money. Now, here's what you need to understand right off the bat here, is that their sin, and they were killed because of this sin by God. Okay, by the Holy Spirit. Whether you like it or not, it's in the text. This is what we see. And by the way, you say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's some more folks that died there also because they were taking the Lord's Supper in the wrong way, in the wrong manner, and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, we're dealing with how the Lord is working. He, shows an, he makes an example out of these two folks right here in this passage of Scripture. And so they get together and say, we're going to keep this money. Their, their sin was not they held the money back. The sin was that they were lying. The sin was that they were, you know, they looked at it and said, we can make a double profit here. We can make some money off of it and keep it. But if we go and tell everybody, hey, we sold it, we'll be like Barnabas. We'll get the accolades and the praise of men. You see, they were very prideful. They wanted the spiritual prestige. They wanted influence in the church. Maybe they wanted to be leaders, but they were not committed to the church. You see, Ananias and Sapphira, and basically I believe Ananias, he had his own personal agenda. You know, I learned a long time ago that Satan can join your church. 
And I learned a long time ago that sometimes people, when they come uh, to the church, they have their own personal agenda. I remember, man, this was 11 years ago, what, here in Jonesboro. Uh, I'd only been here a couple years or something, but I was out inviting people to come to church. And I encourage you to do that. Man, invite folks to come. Next week's Mother's Day, you know, invite people to come, be fun, that kind of stuff. Go hear the gospel proclaimed. And, you know, May the 20th, we got another vision meeting about Perigo Campus. Pastor Blake's preaching, invite folks to come. I mean, all that kind of stuff. But I was inviting somebody, kind of man says, hey, man, I need to come to Central. I'm like, yeah, you need to come. He said, it'd be good for my business. And I, I kind of stepped back and I said, that's not the right reason <laughs> to come to Central. You know, you can have your own personal agenda. That's why we have a membership class. I learned a long time ago about this too that, as I said, people come to that membership class on personal agenda. So there have been thousands have gone through that membership class in all these years. And I always say basically the same thing. I'm a broken record. If you've heard it once, you've heard it a hundred times. I say stuff like this. If you're looking for a church where you're going to know everybody, this is not the church for you because that is not going to happen here. That's not our DNA. That's not the purpose, the mission, the focus of the New Testament church. We're to share the gospel and reach out. We have five services on a Sunday. You want to know everybody? Come get that free hot dog out there, okay? Introduce yourself to somebody. That's just who we are. We are not, and if you're looking for that, that's not where you need to be. And I also say stuff like this. Hey, if you want to give your opinion on every little minute detail, you're not going to be able to do that here at Central. You know, because people will come with a personal agenda, self-serving agenda to join the church of Christ. Sometimes folks want to be a big fish in a little pond where they have control and influence. I believe this is Ananias. Now, you ought to start wondering, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll begin to cross your mind and go, was Ananias and Sapphira believers in the Lord Jesus? Now, as I heard one guy say this or wrote it or I read it somewhere, he says, age-old question. And it's been debated for years. I don't remember when I was doing my master's if we had this debate or not in seminary about these two. But there is a man at Southern Baptist. We're Southern Baptist Church. And, you know, we uh, have the Baptist faith and message. It's kind of what we believe, our doctrine, and all this. Now, there's a man that we may not agree with everything that he has to say. He's not a Southern Baptist. But, I mean, he's upright straight on the deity of Christ and saved by grace through faith and the blood of Jesus and, and all this. I mean, so he's right theologically. And I, there may just be a few things that we disagree with him, but his name is called Dr. John MacArthur. And he has a commentary out. Some of you may have it. It's a, he's a Greek scholar. You do not want to debate him in the Greek. And in his commentary, he points out he believes these two are believers. Do you know as a believer, you can get sidetracked in your faith? How many of you have ever got, as a believer in Christ, you've got sidetracked a little bit, okay? Hey, look, you didn't lose your salvation. Maybe you got off focus. Angie knows I'm like a squirrel, okay? I can go from one thing, and I can jump from one tree to another tree, you know? And, and uh, uh, I was in a vision meeting the other day, and I was talking about, hey, we're in Perigo, and this is where we're going next. And everybody's kind of like, whoa, that's like you just jumped to another tree. Get back in that tree, okay? And so a lot of times I can get off focus and stuff. And we can get sidetracked in our faith. And so what you need to understand in the life of a believer, secret sin is never secret. It does come to light. And here's also what we need to grasp, okay? Secret sin is always sin against God. When you look there in verse 3, it says, Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back to the price of land, you say, well, God knows everything. Yes, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they, they know everything. And so he comes in here and he lies, but what you need to understand that Satan is the father of lies. Satan, you know, you cannot say, well, Satan made me do it. Now, Satan may tempt you, okay? God will test you. Satan will tempt you, but you are responsible for your choices. Ananias was prideful. His sin was not that he held the money back because in the context of the past, I just read it. And so it's not complicated. You get it. He could have done whatever. he. If he said, look, we want to add a room onto our house. And there's nothing wrong with adding a room on your house. But he could have said, you know what? We're going to take some of this money and go add a room on it. We're going to give the other 50% of the sale of the property. We're going to give it to the church. And people went, man, Ananias, praise the Lord for that. That's not what he wanted. He wanted double profit. He wanted to be a person of influence and a person in the church and have all that but not be committed to the bride of Christ. You see, it's never secret, but it's sin against God. He says, Satan has tempted you, and you have fallen into this snare, and you and your wife have concocted this thing, and you come together uh, in regard to this. And so here we have Ananias and Sapphira, and God kills them right there in the place where all the people are standing. Can you imagine if you were there in that crowd, and you know that they just 
you know, Ananias just falls over in front of you, you'd been like, whoa, what just happened here? And you know, it says a young man come and carry him out. Why didn't it say the middle-aged men or the older men? It says young men. So they come and get him. And the young men are like, can you imagine out there digging a hole and burying him going, did you see that? You know, I mean, they're having a conversation. God killed this man because he lied. And so he is the, he's the father of lies. He tempted them. He put this uh, into his heart to do this. And what sin always does, sin always blinds us to the fence of God. You know, sometimes I remember doing a job interview one time, and it was a good cop, bad cop deal, and I was in the ag business. And, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, bad cop was like, would you tell a white lie in business? And I'm like, hmm, is that a yes or no answer, you know? And uh, like, no. Oh, you wouldn't even tell a white lie. You wouldn't tell a little lie. Just a little lie to get somebody's business. I'm like, no. And then, you know, I'm thinking, does this mean I don't get the job? You know, kind of that stuff. And so... What you see here, Satan will blind you to this offense. We do not understand sometimes in a local church how God views the seriousness of sin. Let me give you an example here. Now, now look, do not go out of here and say, don't go out of here and say, Pastor Arch said God will kill you if you don't do this. Do not do that, okay? Because I, I've been preaching a long time and people hear stuff that I did not say or did not intend for that. So do not take this that God will kill you if you don't tithe. Now, let's just talk about that for just a moment because this passage deals with money and greed and pridefulness. And so when you go over in the Old Testament, you go into Malachi, the Lord calls people robbers that don't tithe. He says, bring it to the storehouse. Now, this is not, it's not a tithing sermon. This is not to bring great guilt upon you or that kind of stuff. The Lord says he wants a cheerful giver, but I believe in tithing. If you've been here with me and you come to that membership class, you know I teach tithing publicly. We talk about it. But when the Lord calls somebody a robber, that's a big deal. Now, in Southern Baptist life, a large majority of people do not tithe. They don't give 10%, okay? Do you know God has set this thing up in a local church to work, like, perfectly? But it's got all of us in it, and so we always mess everything up, it seems like. Do you realize how many resources in Southern Baptist life, okay, in the local church, and Southern Baptist made up about 50,000 churches, but do you, do you know how many, if, if every believing person who is a member of a Southern Baptist church would tithe 10% of their income. Do you realize the money for evangelism? Do you realize the resources to plant churches locally and abroad? Do you realize how the Lord has set this thing up? But we've got to ask ourselves a question. Well, why does it appear in Southern Baptist life that only about 20% of people tithe? Now, Central's a generous church, and I believe and I don't know what people give and that kind of stuff, but I believe our percentage of giving is higher than what it may be nationally, but most churches, only about 20% of the people tithe. Why do people not tithe? Because they're more interested in the short game than they are the long game. You know, you ever watch that show, Flipping Houses? Okay, Flipping Houses, the idea is buy low, sell high, right? You make a gain. It's a short gain. It's a flip that's quick. Now, most of us mess up and we buy high and sell low, right? Isn't that how it usually goes? We've probably all done that. That's called losing money, by the way, okay? So, but why do most people not tithe? They're looking at the short game. Instead of laying up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Because they're thinking there's nothing wrong with adding a room on your house, but I could have this room. I could do this. What was going on with Ananias and Sapphira? They were looking at the short game. And we're not thinking about eternity. You see, secret sin is never secret. And secret sin is always sin against God. Now, here's the last part. Secret sin has a consequences. And let me tell you what, there's some heavy-duty consequences right here. It says when Ananias hears the words, he falls dead. And the Bible says that an interval of three hours elapses and the wife comes. Now, ladies, he asks her a yes or no question. You know, sometimes we don't like yes or no questions. We like great questions. Well, maybe kind of over here, and I don't know it over here, and I felt like this, and that happened. This is yes, no, yes, no, Okay. Yes, no. No, I don't know. He said, is this the price you sold it for? Ladies, now, don't shout the answer out, but what would you have done? Would you followed your husband in that lie? You see, submission, and we teach this here at Central, and submission of wives. Okay, we're created equally in the eyes of God. Uh, husband and wife, we got different roles, but it talks about how uh, a man should love his wife the way Christ loved the church. And how a lady should respect her husband. She can win. Ladies, you can win your husband without speaking a word. It's what the Bible says. 
But submission is not following the husband into sin. You see, the Old Testament, when it talks about death, it's death by the hands of heaven. That's what happens right here in the New Testament. With Ananias and Sapphira, it's death by the hands of heavens. And here's what you also need to grasp. Secret sin always causes other people to stumble. Sin has a ripple effect around it. And you may think it's hidden and you may think nobody knows. But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord is going to bring that to light. And it causes other people to stumble. And she says, yes, that's a mount. And he said, Peter basically paraphrased, can't believe you're going to lie to God. And she falls dead and those same young men come in and bury her. And the Bible says that great fear goes all over the church. Now, that would cause a lot of self-examination. The same people are like, whoa, again, this has happened again. Whoa. You know what? I know that their setting different from ours. But if they had like a makeshift altar or place of prayer, they probably dropped it in their knees and said, Lord, is there any wayward thing within me? Lord, is there any sin in my life that I need to confess of? Lord, Lord, I do not. Because, see, what was happening was the purity, the fellowship, the unity. And so Satan comes along and forms this deception. And deception always brings disunity in the church, a personal agenda. The, the bride of Christ is fragile. When I teach in church growth and stuff, and even in seminaries, an adjunct, but the, the thing is that the church is fragile. And so you can bring deception into this and cause these issues uh, in the church. And so... The Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, makes an example out of these two, and they fall dead. Now, this is not original of me. I heard a, a Galaty over at Long Hollow say this, and I want to share it because it's really good. He posed a question. He said, you know, what happens in the lives of unbelievers when they sin? All of us have probably looked around at an unbeliever, and you're not sitting in judgment, but you know they as crooked as a crooked stick, you know. Hey, they've been smoking unfiltered camel since they were five years old and they lived till they're 95, you know, perfect picture of health, run 20 miles a day or whatever. Hey, they have lied, cheated, stolen, and always come out smelling like a rose, got 25 kids, and they're all doctors. I mean, I mean, you look around and like, you know, Lord, I mean, I, I, I you know, I mess up and uh, you do something wrong and pow, you know, but nothing ever seems to happen. And why is it? Because they're not a believer in Christ. You know, you ever been in a restaurant before you had kids, you and your wife are in there, and you look over and there's some kids standing up on the table, and you look at your wife and you go, my child is never going to do that. <laughs> you know, we're always experts on parenting until we actually have kids, right? Okay, we get that. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you're sitting in and your child gets up on the table. But as a parent, you kind of grab them by the arm and pull them back down and say, boy, sit down. Now. Put that napkin under your neck, wherever, and don't get macaroni everywhere, okay? Eat. And you may be sitting in a restaurant, and you're looking across the restaurant, and there's two kids. Hey, they are on the table. They're pulling chicken legs off the buffet and eating them. I mean, they're looking on the buffet, breathing and coughing and gagging on the buffet, you know, and dragging stuff off, swinging from the, well, I don't know if it's a chandelier in a restaurant. They're just swinging. I mean, they're running wild, and, and you're looking at them as a man. This, hey, this has happened. You're, I mean, it's like I told Angel, I said, we couldn't pay enough for this show, you know, watching it. And Ty and Taylor are like, Daddy, what would you do to us? We're doing that. I'm like, I would take you out and discipline you, you know. And so finally, I mean, after 30 minutes of watching that stuff gone, you know, me, I'm like, I, I don't have enough of this, okay. And, you know, it's like you want to get up out of the booth and start over. And what Angel does, she'll reach up very lovingly and she'll grab me by the arm and squeeze it, kind of like karate squeeze, you know. And, and she sees that look when I get up like, I'm going to go get that kid. I don't have enough of this. But she'll squeeze my arm. She'll pull me back down. She'll look at me and she'll say, that's not your child. An unbeliever belongs to the enemy, the devil. It's not God's child. Now, I know you said, we're all the children of God. Read the New Testament. But the book of Hebrews says, as a father, he disciplines the one he loves. Folks, in teaching parenting, you know this. If you don't discipline your children, you know what that means biblically? It means you really don't love them. The Bible says a whole lot about that stuff. Because you want them to respect authority and to do right. And, you know, you're, they're, they're arrows in a, in a quiver. You pull out, you shoot, you know, from a warrior. I mean, it's all this kind of stuff. Now, when you look around as a believer and you say, man, I mess up, I stump my toe, you know, I fall off the wagon, I, I struggle, I get sidetracked in my faith, and I go along there and then pow, God just 
exposes it. Why is that? Because you've been standing on the table. And what the Lord did, he just grabbed you by the arm and said, sit down, boy, now, because you're my child. You see, we don't like that. We don't like being disciplined by the Lord. If you're here today and you've ever been disciplined by God because you fell off the wagon, started walking in sin, maybe the things of the past or reaching out and grabbing had a hold of you and the stuff that used to have you before Christ, and you've kind of fallen back in there, and, and man, it's just, it just happened and it came out and it was exposed. It's because the Lord loves you. Now, one other thing. We'll have our invitation. You say, but he killed two people. If you have a Bible, you can flip over. I'm not going to read this passage to you, but it's in 1 John, and it's in chapter 5, verse 16. It's a sin that leads unto death. We don't like to talk about that. He says, there's sin that doesn't lead to death, and there's sin that leads to death. You say, well, okay, that cannot happen today. Really? You say, preacher, you ever seen it? I believe I have. I had a good friend who professed faith in Christ, seen to follow the Lord. And he fell off the wagon. He didn't lose his salvation. He fell off the wagon. We confronted him. Refused to repent. It was a bad deal. I mean, it's one of them where you preacher, I got in the flesh. I had to repent after getting in the flesh. He just kept on that path and said nobody was going to tell him what to do. And he died. You may say, that. That's not right. It's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There are consequences to sin. Now, we're at a place of invitation. Here's what we're going to do. I don't know what's going on in your heart and your mind. I don't know where you are. I don't know all that's happening in life. But here's what I do know. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to understand. Your sin will find you out. And if it's lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it is, that's like the smoke that's coming from a fire which is down inside. And that fire is basically just kind of smeared around theologically as you're just not right with God. You know, sometimes when I visit with a man and he's messed up in life and he's about to lose his marriage because he made a, uh, a bad mistake. He professes faith in Christ and this, but he just messed up and the marriage is falling apart. He said, well, I just fell into it. And I always look at him and I said, no, you didn't fall into it. You walked into it. And you see, you may be today a man or a woman. You're walking on the edge. And you're going down a path. Maybe it's a, a relationship, a friendship, which, you know, you're getting this little tingling feeling on you. You're married and, and all this stuff. And, and you're thinking, man, it's exciting. It's a secret. Nobody knows. And maybe there's some guys, maybe there's a girl that's doing this. Now, hear me on this, doing this. And, and say, it's a secret. Nobody ever find. Guess what? Your sin will find you out. And so today, it may be the Holy Spirit pulling up a stop sign going, stop right now, stop. Because you get up on that table I'm going to yank you off that table. You get up on that table and you swing. You get on the buffet and you start dragging the chicken legs off. I'm going to come get you. And it's not going to be pretty. Now, do not raise your hand on this. But a lot of us in this room have messed up miserably. And God got us in a loving, disciplined embrace. And so maybe today is a stop sign that the Lord says, you're, you're inching up. Sit down. And so maybe today is a place, wherever you are, you need to confess. You need to repent. You need to get right with the Lord. Now, we're going to have an invitation. And it may be that some of you here and you say, Archie, look, I'm not up on the table as a kid, but I'm leaning forward. And, and maybe you just want to come and just get on your face before God. Women will pray with ladies, ladies with ladies, men with men will pray for you. Maybe you just need to come and talk with a pastor. Maybe you just need to renew your commitment to Christ and maybe rededicate your life to Christ. Maybe there's some, you know, unconfessed sin. Maybe there's some just lying, cheating, stealing stuff or whatever that's going on, you know, around you and it's a smoke of the fire down inside and maybe you've kind of gotten over being saved and you lost your zeal and, you know, you lost that, ugh, you know, serving the Lord. Maybe you've got sidetracked and caught up in the world. Today is a day to make that right. Today is a day you can be set free. Some of you are dragging around a 200-pound weight attached to your leg, and the Lord will set you free today. There's some of you here, you need to be saved, okay? And you know it. The Holy Spirit speaks clarity and conviction. The enemy brings confusion. The Holy Spirit is clear. He's clear. And so you can confess and repent. You can say, Jesus, confessing means agreeing with God. Jesus, you're right, I'm wrong. Jesus, I'm a sinner, you're the Savior. Jesus, 
I repent. I'm not talking about praying some insurance fire prayer. I'm talking about, Lord, I surrender to your lordship. Lord Jesus, save me. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. I, I turn away from sin. And for some of you, that means it's going to not only in your heart and mind, soul, and faith, embracing what Christ did on the cross, but you got to make some changes in life. Maybe you're living with your girlfriend or boyfriend. It means you got to move out. That's repentance. Hey, man, that's getting right with the Lord. And maybe that's what you need to do today and say, Lord, save me. And guess what? By his authority, he says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll save you today. Man, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? You won't be set free? Today's the day. That's good news. That's why it's called the good news. But if you're a believer and you're going down that path, your sin will find you out. He will discipline the ones he loves. So, you know, sometimes it's always like I'd cut my kids and I'd go, is there anything you need to tell me? And then one of them would go, has somebody told you something? I go, no, but do you need to tell me anything? Because it's a lot better for you to tell me than for me to find out and have to deal with it. So we just have confession at the house. Is there anything you need to tell the Lord? Because he already knows. It's a lot sweeter for you just to tell him and confess it than for him to have to grab hold of you and drag you off the table and set you in the seat. So that's what this invitation is about. And as I said, the Holy Spirit's clear. Do not be ashamed of what the Lord is doing in your life. You can be set free today, whatever it is. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, in 11 verses of Scripture, Holy Spirit, I believe you're moving and working, and I don't know what you want to do, but you do, and I pray no one would be ashamed of you. And, Lord, there are probably some here who maybe it's a recommitment of life to you, of living for you, of service to you. Lord, maybe folks are watching baptism and they're saved, they're born again, but they've not been baptized by immersion. And, and so they understand the step of obedience. Lord, maybe someone just needs to come and pray. And just, you know, just get, it's you and them, Lord. There's private sin and there's public sin, Lord. And so, Lord, maybe someone just needs to get right with you, whatever it may be, or someone needs to get saved. And so, Lord, may they confess you as Lord and Savior and come to you in repentance and faith and receiving your blood that was shed for them at Calvary. And, Lord, just put, you know, casting everything upon you and trusting in you by faith for forgiveness of sin. And, Lord, to be set free. Let the shackles and the chains be gone. I pray, Lord, that that takes place today. And so I pray we respond in obedience and faith trust Looking to you, Jesus, and you alone. Your name we pray, the name of Christ. Amen.